Today, we're going to be talking about interpreting Mushkin as a symbolic representation of the conflict between worlds. We're talking about different worlds as in the otherworldly, the religious, and the human, the demonic. This challenge centrals around one key question. Is there room for goodness in this world? Can it be possible to live an otherworldly life, yet at the same time serve and succeed in the world that we are living around us? Now, before we get into talking about these few different aspects, I would like to think first about what do we mean by those two worlds, because someone who might not have interacted with Mushkin before or Dostoevsky before and has no knowledge of the Christian message might feel quite confused about this representation. Well, quite simply put it, the idea of worlds here is best represented by the gospel message of one cannot serve two masters. One either loves one or hates the other. I am not of the world, I am from beyond in the Gospel of John. In the same way, the idea of is there goodness in the world, while well, we're talking about a clash between the religious, the divine, and also what can be seen as worldly passions like money, lust, desire, greed, and all these earthly possessions. Therefore, we are going to be thinking about, well, can you be good, maintain that otherworldliness, but also be successful in this world? And I think Mushkin is a very good example of that in Dostoevsky's works. Now let's get started by thinking about why does Mushkin represent this conflict very well. The biggest reason for this is because although Mushkin is presented as that, as that positively good human being in Dostoevsky's notes and his letters, it does seem to suggest that Mushkin doesn't actually succeed in his mission. He saves no one, Nastasia dies, Rogozhin suffers, kills Nastasia. Everyone he tries to help seems to go down a negative route. And even himself, he ends up in epilepsy. The story seems to regress and fall back upon itself, Mushkin ends up where he started, or if not even worse than where he started, but only left a trail of destruction on his waist behind him. And as a result, some people have looked at that and says, well, actually, the goodness of Mushkin, that positively good human being, doesn't actually save people around him. And as a result, it can be seen as a good example, a cautionary tale, perhaps, of why the conflict between worlds leads to the idea that the otherworldliness is unable to conquer the worldliness. Now, that can be a potential reading, but I don't necessarily think it is a correct reading. Just that one example does not success successfully prove a rule. One potential counterexample, although it would disprove a rule, does not necessarily mean that when you're talking about human nature, which is so dialectical, which is so struck, which is full of struggle and unpredictab unpredictability, there is good reason to suggest that, well, actually, perhaps even though Mushkin didn't succeed, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be trying it anyways, because the reality is everyone who reads Mushkin, or at least most people who read Mushkin, come, come out of the novel with a new sense of awe, with a new sense of respect. They're thinking, well, actually, I admire what Mushkin is doing. How can I live like that? So how do we balance then the idea that Mushkin doesn't save anyone with the idea that we actually want to be like Mushkin? Well, I think a good way to think about it is to turn to two dialectical examples in Mushkin and in Dostoevsky's works. Now, when I mean dialectical, I'm not talking about an idea of a Hegelian synthesis of you having the thesis, the antithesis, and then you're trying to find a synthesis or a mediator between them. But rather, we're talking about two diametrically opposed ideas, the thesis, the antithesis, which is not necessarily joined by a synthesis, but rather a transcending of the dialectic itself, which is a bit of a different concept than the synthesis. So here you have the two examples of Dimitri and the Ridiculous Man. In The Dream of the Ridiculous Man, which is a really fascinating book, you can go access or you could think about the ridiculous man as someone who went to paradise, he goes to this new world, enters this new world, a sinless world, without sin, without sin, but then he enters into that world, and then what happens? His one lie, him teaching people to lie, ruins and corrupts this entire world. So in this dialectical example, it says how one person's evil, one small bit of evil, can then ruin an entire world. On the other hand, you have Dmitri, who starts off in the Brothers Karamazov as a morally corrupt human being. He has struggles, he has a cross, he's, he's suffering. But at the same time, via the goodness that he experiences through Alyosha, through the world around him, his small seed of hope, that small seed of goodness, is able to elevate him towards the truth and towards a, a appraisal and an honour and worship of God. So you can see Dmitri, instead of going down and ruining it, Dmitri goes from the bottom and is able to um, transcend via that small set of goodness. So in some sense, what this dialectical example in Dostoevsky's work is telling us is that when you have the conflict between worlds, sometimes it doesn't need too much for someone to go from a level of baseness 
of shame, of suffering, of difficulty, to be able to overcome that and, the, and transcend his individual circumstance. Yet at the same time, a small bit of evil can also very quickly lead to the destruction of the whole. So how do we tie that back to our idea about goodness doesn't save? We can think about it from this perspective. Yes, it might be right that sometimes goodness doesn't save. That can be one of those examples. But at the same time, by doing well, you might be able to save the individual. There might be a few people out there that although you might not notice it in the beginning, you can be able to help and, and they would be able to be transformed by your goodness. For example, I was meeting an old mentor of mine. Actually, he was my mentor from my old primary school. I met him for lunch very recently. It was a coincidence that we were both in Oxford and we were um, talking together. And, and he said, well, I could never have imagined that I would have such a big influence on your life. And, and the same goes to me when I'm thinking about people I've mentored and helped in the past. Sometimes you don't know how that small amount of goodness can actually help people. Maybe it's not on the large scale that you want, but maybe sometimes on those personal levels, you can make a massive difference on people's lives. So the idea is that via using this dialectical examples and using these um, frameworks of thought, you can say, well, actually, yes, Mushkin is a very good representation of well, okay, maybe he might not succeed in some sense, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try because we can transform people's lives. Now, finally, I'd like to talk about Mushkin as a conflict between worlds and aesthetics as a mediator. So in some sense, you could say, well, this is some Hegelian, but that's not necessarily the case because aesthetics is a third, it's not the, the intermediate between the two worlds. Aesthetics is not the middle ground between the divine and the human. Now, the reason why I say aesthetics as a mediator here and why I think Mushkin does represent this very well is via his phrase, and I think it's one of the core phrases of this work, which is, beauty will save the world. Now, what do we mean by beauty will save the world? Well, beauty will save the world can be interpreted as a lot of things. There's a beauty of redemption of Nastasia Filipinova, which can occur or might occur, which is the beauty that can save the world. One's redemption, you could have the idea of all the saints in heaven rejoicing when someone gets saved. Well, that is the beauty which will save the world. Alternatively, you could say, well, art, art, a beautiful presentation of an aesthetic ideal can save the world. For example, that's the romanticist presentation of these beautiful paintings of art, which can represent, in some sense, a savior of a certain ideal in the world. Now, alternatively, you could think about aesthetics as an idea, as a mediator, as the idea that art for the sake of art is itself a representation of a more fundamental truth. For example, symbolic truth. Now, if you're thinking about why I'm saying this and how does this put together in relationship to Mushkin between worlds, is that Mushkin is fundamentally a heavily aesthetic idea. Mushkin is not necessarily a practical idea. You think in the world, you think of, well, okay, you have Dmitri, who's representative of, of, of a modern person, someone who suffers a lot. You have Rogozhin, a murderer. You have, you have Nastasia, someone who has a horrible past. We can all sympathize each other directly with different characters in Dostoevsky's works. But Mushkin, in some sense, is kind of beyond. He has an otherworldly quality, which we know we cannot live up to. It's a different standard that we cannot live up to. For example, when you're thinking about Christ, a positively good human being, we look up to Christ, not because we are the same as Christ, but because it's an ideal we can aspire towards. And Mushkin has that similar artistic characteristic. Mushkin is that symbolic art figure, that form of what we can aspire towards. And as a result, via art and aesthetics as a mediator between the world and the divine, a way in which we can transcend both of these dynamics to a further realm of understanding and truth. Well, perhaps Mushkin as a conflict between worlds, even if goodness doesn't save in his circumstance, nevertheless, he does represent a fundamental truth which brings him forward in his analysis. Now, of course, this ties us back to the original question. Is there room for goodness in the world? Although one could read The Idiot and feel very depressed and feel very sad about how the situation ends, I think the answer from the idiot is ultimately that there is room for goodness in the world and that that is a very important gamble that we must base our lives upon. We have seen how small amounts of goodness can transform people and as a result we have to have faith on our impacts on the individual. It's way too easy to look at characters like Mushkin and say well okay just because one person didn't save everyone in the world then that means a person is flawed. But sometimes all we can do and sometimes all we need to do to fulfill God's calling in our life is to help that individual, to help the one, help those single individual people who need that help and that is what we need to do and that and we cannot forsake the individual in the pursuit of trying to help the herd. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you also want to check out Dream of the Ridiculous Man, The Brothers Karamatsov, and of course, a copy of The Idiot, then go check it out in the description below. I'll put links so you can purchase it there yourself. 
Hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And thank you. I'll see you next one and goodbye.